Good morning, good evening, depends on which part of the world you are call, uh, you're watching from. I am delighted tonight, this morning, to be with one of the leading uh, philosophers, one of the most recognized philosophers in the world, uh, in particular uh, in regard to the philosophy of biology and the philosophy of science. Uh, thank you, for Professor Soba, for joining me tonight. Pleasure to be with you, Sabor. So, um, Professor, I don't want to get into a lengthy introduction, but you have a prestigious uh, career. Um, you have been a professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Wisconsin, Mid uh, Madison, and uh, your speciality is in uh, the philosophy of biology and the philosophy of science. Um, there's many, many books uh, which you have published, going back to a book published by Oxford University in 1975, Simplicity, The Nature of Selection, Evolutionary Theory in Philosophical Focus, um, Reconstructing the Past, Parsimony, Evolution and Inference, all the way to um, 2018, you published this fantastic book, The Design Argument, uh, which was published by Cambridge University Press, and this is what we're going to be discussing tonight. And you also have a forthcoming book, um, The Philosophy of Evolutionary Thought, which is going to be published by Cambridge University in the next couple of weeks. So I'm delighted to be with you tonight. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Brilliant. So let's get into this book. Uh, you had to go back and read it before the interview because it was quite a while. Uh, Pre-COVID, 2018, I believe, 2019. That's right. So how did this come about? Um, Cambridge started this series called The Elements, which was designed to be a short, uh, it's supposed to be a short book. I mean, the maximum, I think, was 35,000 words. And I was invited to contribute something um, to the philosophy of biology, part of the Elements series. But it occurred to me that I'd rather write a short book about the design argument, because I thought that 35,000 words would be sufficient for me to sort of formulate as best I can what my ideas have been like and how they've developed and changed a bit since I started to work on this 20 plus years earlier. So it's the invitation. And then, you know, I just decided this would be a nice project to do. Brilliant. And I, I, I really like the idea of formulating the design argument in many different ways and trying to sift and filter out which is the best. I, I like the way that you began this section with a quote from uh, Bertrand Russell, um, in which you said, I suggest that some of the uh, these uh, argument forms are, and then you quote uh, Russell here, relatives of, of a bygone age surviving like the monarchy only because they are erroneously supposed to do no harm. My goal in this section is to identify the strongest form a design argument can take. Uh, I thought that was a really brilliant way uh, to begin this section. So you obviously, in the previous uh, chapter, you go over deductive, uh, the deductive arguments. Um, and there's obviously a lot of discussion about whether Paley and others, uh, what, what, what type um, of argument they're trying to make. So you stay away from that topic. You just go into not what a particular uh, thinker is trying to argue, but how it could be argued. What right. was the reason avoided, um, say, uh, getting into why Paley, uh, what, I mean, Oppie's view or your view about Paley or others? Um, that would be, a, I mean, I say it's a little bit about how I think the best way to represent Paley's argument, which is maybe not what he had in mind, but um, yeah, I, I wasn't trying, I didn't want to write, it was 35,000 words, I didn't write it, want to write a history of philosophizing about the design argument. I just wanted to get the best version of it that I could identify. And then, as you know, later in the in the book, I criticized that best way to it, formulate it. Um, so yeah, the history of the design argument is really fascinating. I mean, before Paley, there's this British writer in 1710, John R. Buffnot, hmm. who wrote this fantastically interesting uh, design argument based on the fact that every year in London, he looked at uh, birth records, slightly more boys than girls were formed, and he thought this was divine providence, that God uh, knew that males were going to uh, die 
uh, more frequently than females from birth to adulthood. And God wanted the ratio of males to females to be even, equal numbers of men and women at adulthood, because God wanted each man to have a wife and each woman to have a husband. So it was an intelligent design. And the cool thing about it is that um, the, the sex ratio is always a little bit male bias in each of the 70 years that Paley looked at. And he thought this cannot be an accident. Uh, what, what, and the alternative he came up with was intelligent design. And he, he calculated the probability of there being slightly more males than females in each of these 70 years if it was a 50-50 probability each time a baby was conceived that it would be a boy or a girl. And it was, of course, it's fantastically improbable that it would be 51% in each of those years if the true probability is 0.5. So that's, that's you know, that's a real landmark in the history of statistics and also in the design argument itself, a new sort of probability way of thinking about it. So, I mean, that's, you know, great stuff as far as the history of the subject goes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's get into these uh, formulations. So there's nearly inductive. That's one way that it can be put together. There's inductive, analogical, Bayesian, likelihoodist, which is obviously what you believe is the strongest formulation, and then abductive. So the first, and this is section 3.1 on page 24. By the way, I would highly recommend the viewers <laughs> to buy this book. Uh, I have it on Kindle and physical uh, versions. Um, so nearly deductive. Let's get into this. Formula. Okay, so if, if the, um, in statistics, there's this kind of test that's familiar to scientists called a significance test, where you test a, hypo a single hypothesis by seeing whether it, whether it says that what you observed was very, very improbable. So an example might be you want to test the hypothesis that this coin has a 50-50 chance of landing heads or tails when you toss it, and you toss the coin 20 times, and you think to yourself, well, if I get, you know, it doesn't have to be exactly 10 heads and 10 tails, but if I get 19 heads and one tail, that's so improbable given the hypothesis I'm working with that I can reject the hypothesis. Now, the thing that's kind of logically interesting about this argument is that the hypothesis that the coin is fair does not say that it's impossible for the coin to land 19 out of 20 times heads. It just says it has a very small probability. But what significance tests do, and I'm, I'm you know, ignoring some fine points about it. It basically says that if, the, if, if you observe something that the hypothesis says is very improbable, then you can reject it. Now, yeah. it's a purely, in, in, and in, so when you make an observation, you're either going to reject the hypothesis or you're going to not reject it. So there's no... I mean, one of the interesting and limiting fa facts about significance tests is that they're not comparing one hypothesis with another. And of course, in the case of intelligent design versus evolutionary theory, this is a comparative problem. But here's yeah. here, let me just describe the way some intelligent design theorists have tried to use significance tests. So they say the probability of, let us say, the vertebrate eye having the structure it has given evolutionary theory is extremely low, so low, in fact, that we can reject evolutionary theory because it says that what we're observing is very improbable. Okay, maybe so. Let's come back to that. But now the further question is, suppose we do reject it. Is that in itself an argument for, in, for intelligent design? I mean, it's at most an argument that we need some new theory, but why is that the only alternative to consider? So that's one kind of important fact about the logic of significance tests and how they might be applied and have been applied to intelligent design versus evolutionary theory. Well, let me go back to the idea of rejecting a hypothesis because it says that what you observed was very improbable. So suppose you're lucky enough to, to win a lottery next next week and consider the hypothesis that the lottery is fair there were a million tickets um sold you bought one ticket 
And fair means that your chance of winning was one in a million. Now, according to the rough idea behind significance test, we would reject the hypothesis that the lottery is fair because it says that what you observe, namely your winning, is so super improbable according to that hypothesis. But I think we all have the feeling, well, improbable things happen. That's what lotteries are all about. And we have to make room for the idea that sometimes a theory can be true and yet improbable things happen. I mean, I'm putting it kind of in a, in a loose way, but just to convey the idea of why rejecting a hypothesis just because what it says, the, because the probability it assigns to some observation you made is very low. It's like that's not a killer argument for yeah. rejecting the hypothesis. And so that's, I mean, roughly the reason why I sort of say, People have used this in making design arguments. I'm going to set it aside. I don't think it's as strong as other ways of formulating the argument. Yeah. So that, the next one I considered is an inductive sampling oh, argument, which I think is better. Um, so just before we get into inductive sam uh, sampling, um, you uh, describe Henry Morris and Dawkins as both um, you know, um, delving into these types of um, arguments, and then uh, you cover the Lake Wobegon fallacy, which I thought was a really good example. Uh, so could you get into that as well, please? Just, yeah, I can do that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so Morris uh, said any theory about why adaptive characteristics are found in nature has to say that what we're observing in nature has a probability of at least blah, 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 with some very small number, which he somehow derives from the number of change, some physical thing like the number of changes that could have taken place in atoms since the world began or something like that, some number. And he can, it was one over 10 billion or some, some number like that. And so he's doing a, the, the logic of the significance test is there that no theory could be true if it says that what we observe is less than this number and he made up a number. Yeah. Dawkins, surprisingly, of course, a critic of intelligent design and an evolutionary biologist, uses the same logic to say when we're doing, when we're scientists and we're doing theories about the origin of life on Earth, we have to. The, the, any any theory that's worth paying attention to has to say that the existence of life on Earth has a probability greater than one over n, mm -hmm. where n is the number of available planets that would be hospitable hospitable to life in the entire universe. Yeah, and I think that's an arbitrary thing too. I mean, and getting to the the Lake Wobegon fallacy is something maybe some of your listeners aren't familiar with. Is a uh, a humorist in, in America named Garrison Keillor who had a radio show about a fictitious village in the very coldest part of the United States in, in northern Wisconsin, further north than Madison is in Wisconsin. Sorry, Minnesota, an adjacent state, not in Wisconsin. Lake Wobegon is the name of this fictitious place. And the sort of slogan that he used every time he talked about it is that all the men are good looking all the women are intelligent and all the children are above average. Yeah. So I'm accusing um, Dawkins in this case of assuming that our uh, our planet cannot be, a, 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 must be at least average and possibly yeah. above average in its probability of being amenable to life. And like, why assume that? So it's a little, yeah. it's a little joke. That's, that's all that was. Yeah, yeah. I really like that example. So next is, uh, this is page 28, inductive sampling. Okay, so we look around us and we see complicated functional objects. Some of them are computers and watches and things that obviously human beings have made. And in the cases where we've actually been able to observe how those objects were being brought about, we see that they're the result of intelligent, intelligent design by engineers and people like that. And, so, and the idea of the inductive sampling thing is that we should think of when we look at organisms, that we should just use 
our sample of things that we've actually observed, the processes that produce these functional forms like computers, and say, well, then probably um, animals and plants have the same uh, hist historical origin as computers and watches, namely intelligent design. Um, so your sam it's like you're sampling from this big population of human machines, machines that we know are made by humans and organisms. And we sample and we, and we look at the ones whose causes we can observe, namely people making devices. And then we extrapolate to organisms. And the, the, the limitation for me about this is that it, it's a very narrow picture of what's possible. It's like, it, there are lots of processes where we don't observe them taking place. We, and yet science tells us that these have happened. The idea, for example, we, none of us have ever observed a mass extinction. Mm, yeah. Uh, but yet science says, oh, scientists do not say, oh, therefore that's not a legitimate hypothesis. Scientists think there are just overwhelming evidence that there have been multiple mass extinctions in the history of life on earth. But this inductive sampling thing is saying the only legitimate hypothesis is things that you've actually observed happening in the real world. And to me, that's that's ignoring much of what we do in historical sciences where the past is unknown. Of course, we want evidence for claims about mass extinction, but it's not a requirement that we actually saw one happen. So that, in yeah. brief, is what I think is wrong with the inductive sampling argument. Yeah. And you highlight at the end of this that, um, you know, I hope you won't conclude from this section that I'm against induction. And then you go into the example of the 100 balls at random. Right. That's Maybe a different can... thing because you have an urn and each ball has its equal chance, an equal chance of being observed. And you draw out and you see in your sample of 10 that all of them are green. And you think, well, it's reasonable to think that probably this urn has a very high percentage of green. But you see, we don't draw at random. When we observe things in nature, we can't observe things that happened before human beings even existed. Uh, so the urn model does not really apply very well. Is that The good induction is the urn case. A bad yeah. induction is thinking that we can do an inductive argument about what happened before human beings existed, which might have been involved processes that we don't that aren't going on now, like mass extinctions. Right. Brilliant. So now this is page 30, uh, 3.3 .3 analogical arguments. Okay, this is uh, you we, you were talking, we were talking a little bit earlier about Paley's watch argument. And a very standard way for that people understand this argument is that it's based on an, an analogy. And, and Paley puts the argument this way. So he says you're walking across a field and you find um, this watch and you see that it's beating out, it's measuring time in equal units. That, that's how the, the hands are moving on the watch. And then you open up the watch and you see that it's got many gears and little mechanical devices to it. And you ask yourself, well, what would be the most plausible explanation of why this watch exists, why it has the features it has? And he, Paley says to us, we would agree, Hot. It's ridiculous to suggest that this watch came into existence by some random mindless process like rain falling on the rocks in this field somehow made a watch. I mean, come on. No, we, we just naturally gravitate to the idea that it must have been an intelligent designer who produced this complicated functional device. And Paley says... If you grant me that, that's exactly what we should think when we look at a complex adaptive feature like the vertebrate eye, the eyes that we share, the, the, the camera eye that we have in common with other vertebrates. Um, the idea that it's the result of a mindless um, process is silly. And so you infer um, that the same argument that worked for, by analogy, that the watch is like the eye and that's why we should conclude that intelligent design, since intelligent design is the right explanation of the watch, we should do the same thing with respect to the eye. And it's, that sounds, I mean, of course, this is, Paley was writing 50 years before Darwin, so he, did, you know, he couldn't consider that as an alternative. Um, 
An analogy argument, I think, involves a judgment about how overall similar two things are. In this case, how overall similar the watch is to the eye. And the rule that you're supposed to follow is that the more similarity there is between watches and eyes, the stronger your inference is that the intelligent design argument that seems reasonable for the watch also applies to the explanation of the eye. But when you think about it, watches and eyes are very dissimilar in many ways. Watches are made of metal. They make a characteristic and glass. They make noise. You know, they go tick tock and whatnot. Human beings and organisms generally are really different. So from the point of view of the logic of analogical arguments where overall similarity of the watch and the eye is what's called for, they're not that similar. And so the rule for this kind of analogical reasoning is you should think it's not probable that mm -hmm. the eye was created by intelligence because these eyes have tons of characteristics that watches don't have and vice versa. The, why don't I jump to the likelihood argument here? Because this is a bet, if you don't mind, that's, that's, number five so i'm skipping four and i'll come back to that sure just, that right? just before we, yeah just before we skip that um I, I really like this section in which you say uh the difficulty for analogy arguments that i've described can be circumvented by replacing overall similarity with the uh, following principle to the same natural effects we must as far as possible assign uh, the same causes maybe we can cover this and then jump to likelihood and then jump back if that's okay yeah, that's a, that's a principle from Isaac Newton's uh, book, The Principles of Natural Philosophy, which is where he creates his physical theory about gravitation and, and mo motion, the laws of motion. Um, and he gives in, in, that, in that part of the Principia, it's called, um, he states that as one of the rules of reasoning in doing science, and he gives examples uh, all of which make the principle sound like it's a great principle, a very reasonable principle. So he says, um, the, um, we, when you, we ask whether uh, human beings breathe and human beings breathe and uh, cows breathe and similar effects, Human beings have lungs, so we infer reasonably that, 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 that cows have lungs too. And he gives other examples like that, where it seems like the principle makes a lot of sense. But he, I don't think he looked too hard to try to find problem cases. And I think one of, something like this is the following is what I think I talk about in this in, in, yeah. in the, in the uh, book. Um, Fire, fire, fire hydrants in it was is, is that how I put it. Fire, fire hydrants in the United States are red, and roses are red. Uh, do we want to infer that the causes of roses being red, which has to do with genes and environment, is the same explanation of why fire hydrants are red? That seems silly. I mean, there are lots of similarities that you wouldn't want the rule of reasoning that that newton created to guide your thinking about it you, right. you would say well yeah they're similar in their colors but maybe they have their they're both red for totally different reasons so i so that sort of general rule i think is is you know newton didn't spend a lot of time on working out the philosophical details of that rule i think it's not as strong a rule as he thought it was right brilliant so we can. Uh, you wanted to jump to likelihood and then jump back to. Um, yeah, in a way, it's it's kind of easier. And it, here, so the, the like the, the this is my favorite one, the likelihood version. Right. And I'll I can reformulate Paley's analogical argument without talking about similarity of eyes and watches. Okay. So. Let's start with the watches. Here's 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 what you. So I have two hypotheses about this watch. One is that it was created by an intelligent designer. The second is that it was created by some random mindless process. And Paley says, the, the Paley I'm talking about says, look at your observations of the watch. The watch has a function, telling time. 
and it's a complicated, intricate machine. What's the probability of the watches having those features if it was made by an intelligent designer and compare that with the probability that the watch has these observable features if it was made by a, a mindless random process. And what, a, what the, a, the likelihood principle, the law of likelihood tells you is that the observation you made favors intelligent design over random mindless process because the probability of the watch having these feature if an intelligent designer made it is far greater than the probability of the watch having those features if it was the result of a random mindless process. And I, okay, and so the law of likelihood is a principle for, for looking at an observation and deciding what the observation is telling you about two or more competing hypotheses. What is, does the evidence favor this one over that one or the reverse, or does it not favor favor either over the other. And this are, I, that's perfectly reason. I, I have nothing against that argument at all. Yeah. And I really now, like the I'll, 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 So let me, let me complete. So now the paleo I'm talking about doesn't talk about whether watches are similar to eyes. He just runs the same argument again, except talks about the eyes. Look at the eye. It's con it has a function. It allows us to see what's going on in our environment. Uh, it's a complicated machine. What's the probability that the eye would have those features if it was made by an intelligent designer? Compare that with the probability of the eye having those features if it was made by a mindless ran, uh, random process. And again, Paley wants to say the probability of getting this outcome is far greater if an intelligent designer made the eye than it would be if it was a random mindless process. Yeah. And nowhere do you have to talk about whether the watch is similar or different from the eye. They could, of course, they're different from each other. But the point of interest is that it's a similar fact about the eye and the watch that allows you to discriminate between intelligent design and chance. And I think that's the strongest version of the design argument. Um, later in the book, I had some criticisms of it and other stuff, but that, just for getting started, I think that's the best of, of a lot. Yeah, brilliant. Um, we, we should cover the Bayesian as well. This is page 32, uh, section 3.4. Okay, so Bayesianism, so let me just remind you of something about the likelihood argument. Sure. <clears throat> I did not talk about the probability that an intelligent designer made the eye. I talked about the probability of the eyes having certain features if an intelligent designer made it. So that's a very important distinction. Yeah. Uh, the probability of an observation given a hypothesis is a whole different issue from the probability of the hypothesis given the observation. Yeah. All right. So Bayesians, unlike people who use the law of likelihood as a sort of sufficient picture of how to reason about this, this and other problems. Bayesianism is all about trying to evaluate the probability of hypotheses. So a Bayesian will make use of the likelihood facts I was describing a minute ago, but say, well, there's more to the story than that. What I wanna do is reach a conclusion about the probability that intelligent, an intelligent designer made the watch and compare that with the probability that a mindless random process made the eye. That's their goal is to judge the probability of hypotheses. And it's a fact about that framework that to answer that question, you have to talk about the probability of the hypotheses without looking at any observations at all. You're talking, those are called prior probabilities. So to get a, the, to figure out the probability that the eye was made by an intelligent designer, given the features we observe the eye to have, we have to take it, we have to have as one of our assumptions, what the prior probability is of an intelligent designer making the eye. Based on, and no observations at all, just, 
tell me what the prior probability is. And to me, that is an insoluble problem. Um, and that's, in a nutshell, what I think is a problem for Bayesianism in this context. So, I mean, just to put it in, forget about intelligent design specifically, but the prior probability that God exists, I don't know how to think about that. And there's some traditional ways of coping with it, which I don't think work. I should mention that there's nothing, this point, this anti-Bayesian point I'm making now, it's not specific to the design argument. It's not, it's not some special difficulty of the hypothesis of intelligent design. I don't think Newton's laws of motion have a probability that I can think about or Darwin's theory of evolution or relativity theory in physics. The reason that I'm talking about is I don't know what the prior probability of these theories are. And without a prior probability, there's no way you can figure out what the probability is the theory is given the observations. That's called the posterior probability. After you look at these observations, you change your probability assignment from what it was before you made of observations to the posterior probability. And you have, so you have to start with prior probabilities for these theories. And, you know, I don't think there's any way to do that. So that's what, that's in a nutshell why I think the Bayesian approach to the design argument is not going to work. And it's based on a very general point about probabilities. It's nothing special about the design argument here. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned in this section about Swinburne's picture uh, of the single principle of simplicity. Maybe we can cover that as well. Yeah, so Swinburne embraces, he, he's, he's defending the, the, a version of the design argument and he thinks that it's a kind of requirement of science that we have to have prior probabilities. Just the sort of thing I say, I don't understand that I, I, I try to do my epistemology of science without priors, but Swinburne thinks that's wrong. Uh, scientists and everyday people can't, can't do without these priors. And we need a principle to tell you how, a sensible way to assign prior probabilities, probabilities to hypotheses that aren't based on observations. And he thinks, and this is a this is an idea that has a long history. He didn't, he's not the first person to suggest this, that a natural way to assign prior probabilities is you give simpler hypotheses, higher prior, prob prior probabilities. And as they get more complicated, you make the prior probability assignments smaller and smaller. And that's a way to do it. Um, there are some difficulties in implementing this, uh, which are technical. But again, it just seems arbitrary um, yeah. to me. Uh, there are other ways of assigning prior probabilities where you don't do that, and you can still do calculations if you want to. But it seems they're all they all seem very arbitrary to me. Right. Good. Uh, I guess the one that we've missed is abductive, which is the last one. Okay. So abduction is a word that the American pragmatist, Charles Sanders Peirce, um, introduced as a third kind of reasoning. There is deduction, like in geometric proofs. There is induction or sampling arguments. And then there's this thing called abduction, which is supposed to be a third and different one. Um, in the 20th century, first was the 19th century, in the 20th century, philosoph analytic philosophers have taken up that word abduction and have used it to mean what is often called inference to the best explanation. I mean, there's some yeah. question about whether what philosophers now call abduction is exactly what Peirce was getting at. We don't have to try to get into that now. But anyhow, the idea is, roughly the idea is that you, when you look at it, let's take, of course, intelligent design versus a random process or intelligent design versus evolutionary theory, yeah. competing hypotheses. And the simple idea is what you're asking is which of these two theories or hypotheses provides the better explanation of what we observe. And of course, to flush that out, you have to explain what better means. And the literature on this in, in the second half of the 20th century in Anglophone philosophy of science, 
not just English language, but uh, analytic philosophy more broadly, let's say. Um, philosophers who like this idea have just enumerating different things that make explanations better. Consistency with the observations, simplicity, precision, consistent seeing Coherent. background theories and general general gener, generality. It's just a kind of list of explanatory virtues. And one of the things that makes this unsatisfying to people like me is that these virtues are often in conflict with each other. So you could have yeah. two theories. One of them fits the observations better than the other, but the other one is simpler than the one that fits better. So how do you combine these two virtues and, and tell me which of the theories is overall better? You see the problem? Yeah. Um, so to me, that's, I mean, why, I mean, pending some revolution in philosophy where we, we figure out how to get, reach overall judgments of the explanatory quality of a theory based on n dimensions of consideration, you know, yeah. if we had a theory like that, I wouldn't complain about inference to the best explanation, but as things now stand, I just don't think it's very helpful. Right. Not yeah. like it's wrong uh, or anything, but it's just underdeveloped in a way that I think doesn't help you with concrete problems in science and also in the case of intelligent design versus evolutionary theory. Yeah. I really love the way you put it here that um, a second strategy is to list the explanatory virtue the hypothesis may have, such as fitting the observations consistency with background knowledge, general uh, precision, simplicity, coherence, unification, fruitfulness, and then you quote Lipton. Um, with no commitment to this list having a Bayesian rationale. I mean, just uh, in other words, the same thing you were saying before. Um, do you think this problem is insoluble um, in, in the near future? You know, we, the history of philosophy and the history of science are cases where we're, all, we're often surprised. So, you know, all, all it will take is someone with really cool ideas coming along and saying, look, here, here's how we can organize this thing. And that right. would be a revolution of sorts. Um, yeah. I, uh, you know, I'm, I hope I'll live a number of years more than a few, but I'm not expecting that. Let me, you know. Okay. That's that. fine. Um, so um, you quote Van Fressen. Actually, it's, it's the same point. It's, a, you know, going back to the same point of the philosophy of science. Okay, so we've covered the six, uh, and you believe that the likelihood argument is the best formulation, but obviously later yes. on in the book, you tend to argue, um, uh, you know, this is uh, still problematic because of the problem of God's goals. That's one of the things that you mentioned. Uh, right. This is section five two, and since we've uh, since we've got a few minutes left, I thought we might as well, uh, you know, have a stab at that. Okay, so in that later sections, I'm comparing uh, intelligent design with evolutionary theory, not with a, a, a mindless random process. There's lots of non-randomness in natural selection, so just to be clear about that. Um, so what's the probability of the vertebrate eye having the features we observe, um, given that it was made by a very smart, um, intelligent designer? Well, this depends. There, there are many architectures that eyes could have. I mean, there are, there are 20 or 30 different kinds in, in the world that we observe on Earth, and probably more in other, in other galaxies, for all we know. Um, What's the probability that vertebrates would get a camera eye, but other organisms would get a different kind of eye? Now, you can make up a story. You can say, oh, God wanted uh, vertebrates to have the camera eye, but he wanted a compound eye for certain insects or something like that. But this is just making up. Uh, there's, no, there's no reason to, to. We don't know what God would have wanted to do if he had. Yeah aim to get, give to uh, give an eye to vertebrates. I mean, he might have chosen that, but like, so, so the, the idea that God made the vertebrate eye, what's the probability of the eye having these features given that he did it? Maybe it's very low that if he had done it, he would have, for example, 
not had our eye have a blind spot in it. We, our eyes are inferior to octopus eyes and the fact that we have a blind spot and they don't. So that's to me why the, the theory, the idea that intel, an intelligent designer made this device doesn't tell me what the probability of the device is having the features it had. So that's to me one of the, the, the big problems with the design argument. Yeah. So this is why, I mean, you've been a critic of the intelligent design movement for quite some time. And one of the things that you uh, repeatedly have asked is who is the designer, which is obviously not what the intelligent design proponent I want to get into. Yeah, that's OK. That's the kind of special wrinkle in the way this subject has developed. So create before people said, I am an intelligent. They say of themselves, I am an intelligent design theorist. They would call themselves creationists. And the creationists would be totally up front saying, I'm talking about God. I mean, when I talk yeah. about intelligence, that's who, I'm t that's who I have in mind. But yeah. for uh, special reasons, intelligent design theorists uh, in, in America and elsewhere decided to let, drop the mention of God and say, look, we're just saying that we're arguing for an intelligent designer having produced the adaptations we see in nature. Um, it could be God, maybe. We're not committing on that. Uh, it could be uh, an advanced civilization in another galaxy that seeded Earth with you yeah. know, organisms they built. Uh, it could be um, intelligent designers in the future who, were who understood time travel and sent dinosaurs back uh, to, to populate the Earth long before human beings were around. So they tried right. to be neutral on who the intelligent designer is and the political context for that in the United States was um, the US constitution mandates a separation of, as we say here, church and state. Um, and what that means among other things is that um, a public high school should not have religious indoctrination in it. And therefore you're not supposed to talk about God's being the explanation of anything there. I mean, right. you can, t I mean, just to clarify this for, for members of your audience who might not know about it, the situation in the United States is, doesn't say you can't talk about God. I mean, you can talk about the history of religion. Um, you can talk about understanding different religions and how they have changed historically. What you can't do is try to preach that this religion is true and that religion is false or that atheism is true and all the religions are false. No, you can't. That's that's violating the separation idea. Sure. So so and that's what historically in the legal battles that creationists have been fighting. That's why they were losing in U.S. courts, because people say, look, creation is saying they're they're bringing God in. We can't, you know, we can't do that. And that was the end of it. But intelligence design theorists thought, let's take the G word out of it. And maybe this will just be a, a, a legitimate hypothesis. That didn't work. Right. Okay, as my last question, as we're coming to the end of this session, uh, is the same question I put to uh, Michael Roos and Dembski just a few weeks ago. Um, this is just something I was thinking about. Um, it's related to the problem of God's goals. Uh, the, uh, the, the point uh, that I wanted to ask you is, could... Could it not be argued that the um, the predictions of a design from a natural, uh, the blind watchmaker, the, the nat natural selection being the designer, um, because of the, the way the uh, mutation selection uh, mechanism works, we can't predict what's to come in the future. Um, I mean, it's uh, natural selection being non-random, obviously mutations being random. I know you've done... Uh, you know, uh, some, some interesting work on that as well. Uh, but in a way that um, it is in the natural selection as uh, in terms of what it can make in the future and God as, as a general uh, designer uh, could actually uh, come to the same design. So it's, it's indistinguishable as in an observation is in, yeah. indistinguishable. Um, so you can't adjudicate, you can't, um, I mean, I, I know you, you also criticized the way that some uh, atheists have used evolutionary theory 
to you know um, argue uh, for atheism, and you said that they need uh, presuppositions for that. Uh, well, I mean, what do you think about this uh, this problem? Well, the, the, let me let me focus on the, the, the beginning of what what you were saying. The idea that you can't predict mutations. The idea, I think, our experience, you know, the experience that biologists have, allows them to predict that when you introduce um, antibiotics into human populations, um, there will be muta mut mutations will eventually arise that make people in in the uh, the, the germs you're trying to kill that'll make them immune. We see this happen again and again. So the history of our, under, of our historical understanding, our historical understanding of the evolution of uh, anti, antibiotic resistance, for example, allows us to say, you know, th this is gonna happen again and again. Now that's not the same as saying th this exact mutation on this chromosome with this sequence characteristic is gonna happen. But in a more qualitative way, there are things you sort of expect to happen. Yeah. And, you know, this is part of epidemiology, uh, mm -hmm. understanding these regularities. Yeah. Um, so, but I, so you're, so, well, let's go back to the another part of your, your idea, which is that let's suppose that <clears throat> evolutionary biology can't do very much in terms of predicting the future. I think it can, and neither can the belief that God is running, you know, running adaptations is going to tell. We don't know how to predict from that hypothesis either. Yep. Um, even if that were true, we can say, well, uh, maybe the future is uncertain in, in many important ways, but what about the past and look at the way in which evolutionary biology explains and predicts things about what happened. It might seem sound strange to talk about predicting something in the past, but here's an example of what I have in mind. Darwin um, predicted that there were organisms that were intermediate between birds and dinosaurs. And he was right. I mean, that's what Archaeopteryx was. So there are lots of things that you can, the theory tells you, here's something that probably happened. And then, of course, you want to go search for fossil evidence, perhaps. Right. Yeah. I mean, th that's a good way of um, um, giving, giving an answer to that question. I just want to slightly uh, rephrase it because uh, I'm trying to get to a particular point, which is that um, a given observation, even in the past, uh, cannot be used to rule out all God hypotheses, maybe some God hypotheses as opposed to others. I, I completely agree. And here's, here's, here's one. If you observe X, uh, that does not rule out the hypothesis that God made X true. Yeah. I mean, that hypothesis has a likelihood of one in the sense that the probability of X given that God made X true is as big as a probability could be as a value of one. So, yeah, so good. So the general, the general point you're making, which I really agree with, is when you think about um, different ways of formulating intelligent design hypotheses, one way that I, those hypotheses can differ from each other is how they describe God. Yeah. What characteristics are they are they assigning to God? And if that will figure in their making, they might therefore make different predictions about the world. Yeah. Um, maybe, you know, a deistic God is the safest <laughs> option in terms of probabilities here. Uh, that's well, it's it makes no predictions on its own, really, because it's just saying that everything that we that you can observe is due to the laws of nature and the initial conditions of the universe, and God doesn't intervene in that. So you can just use science, and in, in a way, deism is not not saying God explains something that science can't explain. Well, God, that's that's not exactly right. What God explains is why the laws of nature yep. had the form they do, 
and yeah. why the initial conditions of the universe were as they were. But after that, that's it. Yeah, absolutely. So Thank the you. Idea of God is, uh, the idea of God is an inter, someone who intervenes in nature after the universe is created. That's, that's not deism. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Uh, so thank you, Professor Soba, for that enlightening session. Um, I would love for you to give a brief description of your upcoming book, which is going to be published by Cambridge University, The Philosophy of Evolutionary Theory. This is a book that doesn't say one word about intelligent design. It's about the basic concepts and arguments in evolutionary biology common ancestry, natural selection, random mutation, um, uh, random genetic drift, um, things like that. And I try to, I, the, each chapter is organized around one of those concepts, starting with Darwin's ideas on, on those ideas, and then talking about modern biology and trying to develop philosophical themes from that. Brilliant. Thank you, Professor Soba. Uh, if anybody wants to follow your work, uh, where can they find you? Um, I have a website at the University of Wisconsin, so that's that's a good place to look for information you're, about my you're research. Not, you're not really on Twitter or <laughs> you're not really no. on social media? No? no, no, I'm not at all. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much, Professor Soba. It was a pleasure speaking to you, and I hope to have you soon again when your new book is published. Thanks, Sugor. I enjoyed our conversation.